Michael. Uh... Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing all right. Yeah. So you excited? You pumped? I'm something. I don't know. Yeah. Kind of more indifferent. <laughs> so what were you doing fooling with your phone there? Uh, the Fox News app was just our, yeah, I get news updates on my phone. Mm-hmm. And so Fox's updates have, and it just started this week, like the week of the election. Like all of their updates are like teasers for you to like open up and read the full thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't want that. I want all the information in the banner. Or I don't want it at all. Like, I mean, I don't I don't want to have to do something to find out what you're talking about. Yeah, I get it. I actually, um, so you're you're one of those. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is essentially what it comes down to. I, so I tell people at my office all the time that uh, you need to put everything, to, that when we're sending information out to our contractors, yeah. that you need to put everything pertinent in the subject line. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you if they get that far, yeah. then it's... <laughs> Yeah, it's a that, miracle. So everything that's important that you're sending them to them in an email, it needs to be in the subject line of the email. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I can, I, I definitely understand that way of thinking. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't like to click on stuff. Like yeah. I want it all to be right there. Well, I, I have an advantage because I deal with finances. Yeah. So um, all I've got to do is put in the subject line, please read this affects your pay. <laughs> yeah, all of a sudden that email got open. <laughs> and yeah, they'll read the whole email then. Yes, <laughs> it's, it's important stuff right here. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well. So how'd you survive the biggest election of our lifetime? Um, I, uh, let's see. Well, I didn't pay any attention to the coverage at all on Tuesday. Um, Good job. I didn't uh, actually get to vote. Uh, because the lines were longer than I'd ever seen before. Actually, I've never seen a line before. Um, I've been voting here for, let's see, I moved back down here in 2006. So I didn't vote in 2006 because I just moved back here. I've been here less than a year and I just didn't even really know. Well, no, it was, but I I wasn't, I didn't know any of the people. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so I've been voting here like 12 years, I guess. And I have never had to wait in a line before. And Man. that line wrapped around and around. I was fixing to say, so I waited in that line, and I've re- I've waited in lines shorter in Disney World. Than yeah. I have. <laughs> in that line, I mean, that was so I waited an hour and a half, and feel like I got lucky because I ran into a buddy in the parking lot, mm-hmm. and um, he was like, "Oh man, like when I got here, the line was out to where we were standing in the parking lot." I was like, holy crap. I didn't realize it was like wrapping the building. So I walk up there and finally find where the line's at, and yeah, it took an hour and a half. So I even had an, I even had an in because I took my mom up there. Yeah. And of course, like she's, you know, with a walker and everything. And, um, so we thought, okay, well, there's going to be some line for a handicap that you can just, they, y'all should have just walked to the front door. They, they yeah. were, they were telling people as they came by like elderly and people with walkers and stuff mm-hmm. to just go in. Yeah. Like there wasn't like a line or anything, but like the, the cop that was out there like patrolling the area, I'm using mm-hmm. quotes, um, was waving people, older people just right on in. Yeah. And well, they, they would have let you in with her. Like that's mm-hmm. what they were doing. Yeah. Well, we, we actually talked to, uh, to a cop out there in the parking lot Really. and, um, he was like, well, I don't know. I just got, it was a, uh, a, a former student of hers actually oh, okay. too. So, but he said, uh. Well, I just got here, but I don't know anything. Let me let me go ask the guy I'm relieving. And so he yeah. went over and talked to him for a minute, and he came back, and he was like, he doesn't know of anything either. It doesn't sound like there is a handicap line, and even if there is, I don't know what they're doing about parking. There's definitely no parking for you. Yeah. And uh, so um, we drove back out and looked at the line again. I said, Mom, what do you want to do? She yeah. said, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's, wow. She said, check again later. And if it, if it's shorter later then you know, maybe we'll try again. And so I talked to you later Yeah. and then I went back up there and checked it, uh, maybe two hours after that. And it was yeah. still wrapped around and around. I said, there's nobody in there that I, there's nobody on that ballot, nothing on that ballot, actually, that I am so excited that I feel like I really need to vote for that. I'm going to wait for an hour and a half or two hours. So, yeah. Oh, I waited it out. I did. I did the thing. <laughs> Yeah. So. Well, good for you. Yeah, I and, guess. And you didn't even vote libertarian. You I, bastard. I did not. <laughs> I protest voted against the libertarian. That's, I protested my own party. Yeah. 
So I can't I can't totally dismiss that as uh, being valid, but that's just I'm, that's just terrible. Uh, they need to do better. Uh, like I say, you're on the committee. Tell them. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on the committee. I don't know what you're talking about. Nobody <laughs> listens to me. Uh, I I have been saying what I have to say about it. No. Yeah. We don't have enough. I, I guess the uh, the Libertarian Party elite are not listening to our podcast. Apparently not. So maybe we hadn't even gotten any angry emails from them telling us to stop criticizing the party. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Uh, um, maybe by this time next year. <laughs> yeah. Well, two years. Two years. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, it's this is uh from what I've seen. So this is Thursday night after the election. It yep. is still unknown. Um, it will probably remain unknown for a month. Um, you think it, because they're going to, well, well, a I lot mean, of these places are really close and it, there's automatic recounts if there's less yeah. than a certain percentage difference. I guess that's true. I mean, they are really close. So I was looking at it. I looked at it a couple hours before I came up here and, um, I mean, all of your, I mean, there's still a path for Trump, but he's got to basically take almost everything left. Um, and a couple of them look promising, kind of looked promising the other day and are less promising now. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. It, it's looking to me like we're looking at a Biden win here. Yeah. Well, all Biden needs is Nevada. Yeah. If he, yeah, if he gets that, it's done. Uh, Nevada or more. Um, the, yeah. the vote that doesn't count is Alaska. Alaska could go to yeah. either one of them and either one of them could still win. Yeah. Um, but if if Biden gets Alaska, then Trump has to win everything else. Yeah. And uh, Trump has to win everything else if Biden doesn't get Alaska, too. Yeah. And um, some of those just don't look promising to me. I mean, I yeah. guess it could still go either way. But like I say, it looks like looks like Biden's going to be our winner, which, you know. At least initially. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I was telling the guys at work today, though, like, so Trump's doing all of this stuff with – um like filing all these lawsuits and doing mm -hmm. all these, this stuff. I was like, the stuff never goes anywhere. Like you're not going to change anything by doing any of that. Yeah, I don't not. think, I mean, you know, it's, it, it, it gives him something to tout and say he's doing, mm -hmm. but I, I just don't see any of that changing anything. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting is of course they're going to start complaining really soon about him not conceding the election. Yeah. And, um, Oh, that's coming. And I, I go back to what he said in the debate um, well, essentially what he said in the debate, which was that they still haven't conceded the 2016 election. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> like, they still haven't transferred power. Yeah. Um, and this isn't, even if he loses, this is kind of a win. Yeah. Um, because he has everybody with influence against him. Yeah. And, and, and covering for Biden in many ways. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, yet still, it's going to be razor thin. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, yeah, there's going to be no, there's been no landslide here for yeah. sure. There's a really big chance that this ends up being a 270, 268 yeah. <laughs> victory for Biden. I saw some um, scenarios the other day, which I know the night of the election, they were talking about the tie scenario. Yeah. Cause that well, was, that can't happen now. It can't happen now, but at the time it was in play mm -hmm. still. Yeah. I was like, oh, that would yeah. have been interesting. Yeah, that that could have been fun. <laughs> um, the the crazy thing would be if uh, they suddenly find a million votes for um the Green Party candidate in Nevada or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and Nevada ends up going to a, a third party, and Trump wins everything else, and nobody gets two seventy. That would be interesting. Oh, yeah, it cool. won't happen that way. But no, that I would know. be so funny. Well, obviously it won't happen, <laughs> but man, that would be cool. <laughs> I can't remember the Green Party candidate's name. Howard something or... So what happens if neither candidate makes 270? I've never thought about that. Then it that. goes to the House. So it goes to the House? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I knew um, that's what they did. I knew that that's what happened if it tied. I didn't know if that was the same if they didn't reach it. Yeah. Well, in, uh, in a lot of ways, I think that the, the political class would love that. Yeah. Um, completely take it out of the hands of the American people. <laughs> right. I mean, it's only barely... Like it's it's just a veil anyway, as far as I'm concerned, that it's in the hands of the American people to begin with. Yeah. And you know, if they could just uh, completely remove that constitutionally, which is <laughs> essentially what would happen if nobody hit fifty percent, yeah, um, then I think that they would be happy to do so. Oh, without question, yeah. I think. Oh well, we'll just decide on the next president. Yeah, hey. <laughs> right. Um, somebody was asking me today, so. Uh, 
I went ahead and, and gave my theory on the over under for uh, Biden, um, how long Biden stays in office. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I, I say the over under is three months. I don't think he makes it to May. Wow. Yeah. I don't think he makes it to May because they've already done the setup to remove him with the 25th Amendment. Yeah. Um, it's all ready to go. Uh, so it, I, I don't think he makes it to May. And then the question was posed to me, well, what happens? Like, how do we select a new vice president? If Kamala Harris takes over, they don't. The they, one of them doesn't select the next one. I mean, I don't well, actually know. <laughs> well, this is the funny thing, right? <coughs> is that we're already doing this wrong yeah. because still constitutionally, yeah, the person who finishes in first place in the presidential election is the president, and the person that finishes in second place is the vice president. Yeah, that's what our constitution <laughs> says. That's the law of the land. But FDR said that he wouldn't run again unless he got to select his own vice president. Yeah. And so after he selected his own vice president, then the other party was like, well, we're going to select our own vice presidents too. And yeah. nobody ever changed the law. Like there has so no the, been, <laughs> there has not been a constitutional amendment about this. So there's, this is, un, this is a constitutional crisis. Yes. We've had <laughs> unconstitutional elections since FDR. Nice. <laughs> Not surprising, but still crazy. But that so, being the case, uh, either Kamala, ostensibly Kamala, but I, I would guess that essentially the Democratic uh, National Committee, the Democrat National Committee, will choose the would choose the next their, vice president. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, huh. we're we're definitely not going to have another vote. We're, we <laughs> well, might choose wrong. I did. Well, yeah, I knew there wouldn't be a vote or anything <laughs> like that. I did think that. Yeah, I mean that's about what I had figured is that Kamala would would make that pick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I doubt she'll actually make that pick, but yeah. She will be told who to pick. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so um, so uh, this is, but this is like the worst possible scenario. Yeah. Um, in, in order for things to, for anybody to have any legitimacy as the next president, they would have had to have, we needed like essentially an undisputed election. Yeah. We needed somebody to win so big that nobody could question it. And then they would at least have the appearance of having the authority of the, the people to do what they wanted to do. Yeah. 270, 268 is not that. No. Yeah. Well, and taking this long, like, cause I really thought I stayed up to about one Tuesday night watching the results come in. And I thought that there was at least a decent chance that one of them was going to win big enough that they'd end up calling it that night. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously that wasn't the case. And I got irritated because at about 1230, they were like, oh, well, they've, count they've stopped um, counting votes in Pennsylvania. And I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. Like, why would they stop counting votes? Like, we're not going to make it done tonight, so let's just call it an evening. What? Well, and he, so you wonder how they do this anyway. Is that like, okay, everybody stop what you're doing. Don't move any papers or anything. Leave everything exactly where it is right now, and everybody file out of the room. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I'd like to know. I'd like to see how that exactly works. I mean, yeah. And and my immediate reaction was, how is there not going to be fraud in that? Like, I mean, that you just, it just feels like as long as you got people in the building doing work, there's less chance for there to be some fraud mm -hmm. than if you have everybody file out and leave and everybody come back in. Well, yeah. What if so-and-so <laughs> decides to come in early tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, the person that locks the door. Yeah. Like, what if they decide to move some things around before they lock up? Exactly. I mean, yeah, I know, I agree. Now, my general theory is that the fraud on both sides tends to offset each yeah. other yeah. <laughs> you know that it's all a wash in it's the all end. yeah um that they're like every election is fraudulent but since both sides are, are committing fraud at roughly the same pace that it's it yeah. doesn't actually affect yeah if you don't like the it, get winner better, right <laughs> um, it affects the outcome but not the winner if yeah. that makes sense where you yeah. know the, both, the both sides, sides are, that are already kind of a little bit Republican become much more Republican due to fraud and the sides that are a little bit Democrat become much more Democrat due to fraud, you know, yeah, it kind and, of balances it, itself out. Yeah. Creates balance in the force. Um, now what's interesting though, I thought looking at the numbers is that, um, that our racist president, Donald Trump, uh, made gains with, um, with blacks, yep. men and women and with Hispanics. Really? Um, oh yeah, because, um, where he lost ground was with white people. <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't realize that. Yeah. I knew and he actually has more votes now than he did in the last election. Yeah. Well, I knew he had done pretty well in Florida due to the Hispanic vote that mm -hmm. he had, that, that he, 
he had really won them over, at least in yeah. Florida. Yeah. So now, and when I say he gained ground with blacks, it's not like it's a lot small. of blacks voted for yeah. him. Yeah, they, they. I think black men went from something like eleven to seventeen percent, and black women went from like four percent to eight percent voting yeah. for Trump. So it's not like huge Massive, numbers yeah. uh, of total people, but the the difference, like the change, but the percentage is yeah, is, the percentage change is pretty significant. Is, yeah. Um, and another thing that I find to be really odd here is that. It is likely, I would say at this point, that Trump will have won um, Florida, Texas, Ohio, and Pennsylvania and still lose the Electoral lose. College. Yeah, that's crazy yeah. right there. Like, who who could have picked that? Yeah. <laughs> You'd end up with a mix like that. Well, it, it brings us to uh, an interesting question, which is what happens next? Yeah. Like, where does this all leave us? Yeah. Um, and you know, after a month or what, however long it takes for them to figure it out, I, I guess they have essentially till the electoral college casts their votes. Yeah. Um, to figure this all out. Uh, after that, regardless of who's the president from there, what happens next? Yeah. I'm asking. I, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't really have an answer. I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out. I mean, I do think it was. I, we're going to have a divided Congress again. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the the Republicans were able to keep the Senate, and the and like I say, yeah, the Democrats kept the House. Yeah, but they lost, did lose some but seats, but they lost yeah. ground in the House. Um, and I think that's good. Like going, in, especially if it is going to end up being Biden, mm -hmm. I would much rather see him going into a divided. Yeah. Um, that way, I mean. Well, I that, like that no matter what. I, I like mean, it the, no matter what. Yeah, the best thing a libertarian can hope for is that the is government divided. is incapable of doing anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. But uh, the big thing I worry about, and this this is with both sides, is um, Second Amendment issues. Yeah. Um, especially if we have a Democrat in the White House. Mm. But honestly, even if we have Trump in the White House, I still worry about my Second Amendment. Yeah. I mean. Well, even, he he. He assaulted the Second Amendment more while he was in office than Obama did. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and, the reason, like, divided is good. Like, yeah. let the Democrats keep the House, like I yeah. say. I mean, so. Well, um, a couple of things about this. So I, I think, like, we're running into a rough time. And I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about the difference between power and authority. Um, and I, I hope that this will lead into a discussion about kind of what's next and how views of government have changed and, and so yeah. forth over time. And, um, so, and I'm not pulling this from any book or anything like this is a semantic thing. And it's something that I just think about a lot. And so yeah. my opinions may not reflect the, like the prevailing views of, uh, you know, philosophers of this kind of thing or whatever. But, um, the way I've, I've always looked at it is authority, at least legitimate authority, yeah. um, is generally granted, um, yeah. that it's voluntary, that we're giving up, uh, s <laughs> some um, choices to somebody that we're granting the authority to make those choices on our behalf. Yeah. Right. The power okay. is the ability to coerce your way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, essentially. And uh, so it, it, it comes up a lot in questions of government. And I, I think that we could look at, for example, the COVID stuff um, yeah. from both perspectives. Now, authority can be, um, can be recovered as well. Like it can be granted and then recovered yeah. is the idea anyway. Yeah. Um, legitimate authority again. Yeah. Uh, now there's people that presume authority that haven't been granted it. That doesn't mean that they have it. The question is whether they have the power to enforce it. Yeah. Yeah. Do they actually have that authority or not? Yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't matter whether they have the authority or not if they have the power to enforce it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But sometimes you gotta like, like pull that lever or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like you gotta, but like with the COVID stuff, um, so if you talk about locking people in their homes, uh, and there's crazy stuff going on around the world. Like I, I was asking, um, a, a girl I know who's Greek, what she, how the Greek people are going to react to these new lockdown measures that they have going on in Greece that just started yeah. where like you need the government's permission to leave your house <laughs> for various activities. Like, I mean, yeah. in the sense that there are a few activities that they will allow, allow you, to, you leave to leave your house for, and you need permission. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I thought, I can't imagine any people 
Yeah. Like accepting that. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially <laughs> the, here in the U.S., like we would not. Well, you say that, but actually. Well, I say been, in the U.S., I mean in the South. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fair enough. The, there's probably more to your argument there because the other yeah. thing that I was going to point, because we haven't really locked down hard in the South. Like, no. Yeah. Like there's even ever when they, at any point. Yeah, yeah. Even when they were trying to enforce lockdown measures, the, uh, the authorities here, authorities yeah. in quotes here, we're not really enforcing any of that no, stuff. No. Um, but, you know, they, they've they locked down hard again in France and Germany. Um, the UK is starting again. Um, and I, I, what I've seen, Spain, um, what I've seen is that they've got protests going on all over Europe about the lockdown measures. Oh, yeah. Now, in France, actually, it's the students that are protesting, and they're protesting about how they've gone back to school and there's not adequate social distancing measures in place or something like that. Typical French. But <laughs> most of these places where there are protests, they're protesting against the lockdown measures. Yeah. Well, and we have. And we're not really doing that here. Well, no, but the, the lockdowns haven't hit as hard as they can. Like right when, I'm trying to think about, well, right after everything had gotten really bad for a while and some of these states had put down some pretty serious lockdowns, like there was some armed protest going on right when they started opening things back up. Um, I'm trying to think about right around what time that period that was, but I remember when it happened. It was right before the Black Lives Matter stuff started. Yeah, it was like March, April, something, something like that. There. Yeah, and and it it didn't last long, and there wasn't a whole lot of them, and then it just kind of shifted into the Black Lives Matter, and things started opening back up. Yeah, um, and but I, I think we could that you're see right. they were very small. They though. were, but it was it was like and it was like people showing up to town council meetings armed and yeah just making their presence known but it was um, the start of what could like i say if we go full lockdown i think you'll see massive amounts more of that mm -hmm. at least once again at least down here we can only hope <laughs> yeah well i would definitely hope <laughs> um but the the point i was going to make is that while the uh law enforcement um has the power in a lot of cases, at least on yeah. an individual basis in terms of like individual households. Yeah. Um, actually, law enforcement doesn't really have the power to do a whole lot if people, you know, bind together and, and resist as a group. Yeah, but exactly. as individuals, um, law enforcement has the power to keep us locked in our homes, but yeah. they've never had the authority to do so. Yeah. And the, because the government doesn't have the authority to tell you where you can go and where you can't and when you can leave your home and when you can't and yeah. for what purpose. Like that authority has never been granted. Yeah. Um, the question is whether they have the power to enforce their dictates, whatever yeah. they happen to be. They, and it would be a serious question whether they even have the power to because – and I always make – have heard this argument at least with the second amendment stuff mm -hmm. is like the police aren't going to confiscate your guns. The police, most plenty of police are pro gun and just wouldn't follow the order. Um, and you may would run into, you may. say that, but there's been a lot of some of these antagonistic interactions between police and people have been because the police got one of these, you know, red flag, uh, notifications and came to collect that person's guns. Oh, absolutely. Well, like I said, that's always... So they do collect people's guns. Yeah. They oh, do they come absolutely and confiscate do. people's guns. But you're talking about a whole different scenario when you're talking about nationwide. Like, yeah. we're going to come in your home and take your guns. Well, the like I said, the, the question becomes whether you can get people to group together. Yeah. Um, because as as individual households trying to uh, stand up against the police, you don't not stand a chance. You don't stand much of a chance. Yeah. Right. But if, if you... Um, group together to stand up against the police, then yeah. um, they they don't have the power to take on like, like my neighbor. I was fixing to say like all of Lake Forest. Yeah. That would be where you'd kind of draw the lines at. So like everybody in Lake Forest decides we're not going to stand for this. Yeah. And like start blocking the entrances and exits. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to do that either. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I, you know, I do want to stress that, that um, real legitimate authority is granted. Yeah. It's voluntary, yeah. um, and it can be it can be removed. Yeah, and this is this is one of the things that that people don't understand about the federal government. I think for the most part at this point, because it's just not taught anymore, um, is that the federal government is a creation of the states. Yeah, like so, it is the states are not subservient to the federal government. Yeah. They created the federal government. The federal government is subservient to the states. The states granted specific authorities to the federal government yeah. to handle. 
and that's all that they were given to handle. Now it's it's gone way it's past that now. now yeah. But if you think about it in another sense, like slaves don't get together and select the master. Yeah. Right? That's not how this works. Yeah. So the creation of the states cannot be cannot be an authority over the states. Yeah. On the whole. Yeah. Um, and like I said, there were specific powers granted. Um, and yeah. and that would be authority. It was voluntarily given. Yeah. Right, but they stepped well past that now. Yeah, we just don't enforce it anymore. And yeah. people think of this as a single state. Yeah. The the United States, yeah. people think of it as a single state. But the truth is that it was always meant to be yeah. sovereign states that have agreed to a a compact, which is essentially a contract between political entities. Yeah. Um, have agreed to a compact whereby they created a government that would handle some specific things on behalf. Of, of those states, yeah. but those states were sovereign and independent. Yeah, and yeah, really after the Civil War, that kind of ended that as far as that goes. Yeah, oh yeah, that was absolutely yeah. the end. Yeah, um, but because you I'll were tell you because the, that that's the answer to all of these problems is yeah. secession. Exactly. Well, and that's something I'm a big believer in is yeah. is secession just in general, and I I I would like to see more governors and stuff it maybe not run on like a full secession like like platform mm -hmm. but at least push back some run on the platform of pushing back against the federal government and mean it yeah or whatever the government above is yeah. like my uh, position has always been that as the leader of any political entity yeah um that your job is to protect that entity from the entity above it yeah Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that if you are the governor of a state, your yeah. responsibility to that state is to protect the state from the federal government. Yeah. If you are the the town council leader or whatever, your yeah. responsibility is to protect that town against the county, against the state, against the federal government. Absolutely. Like your job is to maintain your own political independence. Yep. Um and and the political independence of the people that you represent. Yeah. Because those people know best how to govern themselves. Yep. And it, when you pass it all up, what it, you're essentially saying is that that there can be one rule that 330 million people in this country all agree with and can get on board with. And that's just not the case. I mean, there are rules that 330 million people roughly can get oh, on board with. Absolutely. But when you make too many of them, then when, suddenly you start to step across. And there shouldn't be a situation in this country where every four years we decide which half of the country is going to be miserable for the next four years. Yeah, And that's where we're at. And that's the reason I think that a uh, succession is, is the right answer. Is the is the solution? Yeah, is the we just need to start breaking the states up. Yeah, I mean, you I know? was trying to. I was talking with my mom last night, or maybe the night before, um, about a lot of this stuff, and I said, you know, the the thing is that if we have reached a situation where we cannot agree, yeah, on how this country should be governed, yeah, and we're then, there, we're there, yeah then we need separate governments yeah. because if you impose a government on a people that don't want it, yeah. Well, then and that's where the, where are you? I mean, you're you're essentially authoritarian already. Yeah. Um, like uh, Lysander Spooner wrote in his essay, uh, uh, was no no treason. That was the essay, I think. He yeah. said something along the line, and he's talking about the Civil War. Yeah. Um, but he said something along the lines of uh, that if um, if it is has been established by the results of the Civil War that a government can impose itself on a people that don't want that government then the number of slaves in this country has been greatly increased rather than greatly diminished. Oh, that's such a great quote. Yeah. It's so true, too. Like, it really is. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, political slavery is no different than chattel slavery, except in degree. Yeah. Not in kind. It's the same kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, Absolutely. So, um, yeah. and so the, the question then becomes um, that, so I'm not an advocate for armed revolution. No, no, right. me neither. Um, but I would say that you should arm yourselves to defend you yourself should... against somebody who believes they have either the power or, the, or authority to tell you how to live your life. Oh, I'm I'm all for being prepared for all situations. Yeah. Like, I mean... I don't hey, I'm an Eagle Scout. <laughs> yeah, hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't believe in, like, armed revolution, but, like, 
if it's going to happen around me, I'm going to be prepared for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I do believe in armed revolution. I, I mean, I think that there's a point where you don't have a choice. Yeah. Um, well, when it starts going on around you, you don't have a choice. <laughs> you know, but I, I, but I don't advocate for it, at least not yet in this situation. But like yeah. I said, I think that you should arm yourself to, to defend yourself at this point yeah. against any group that thinks that they have either the power or the authority to tell you how to live your life. And by the way, like if we're like, if this is the precursor to a civil war, which I keep hearing joked about. Mm. Like, I don't really like either side. Yeah. No, <laughs> like, like, can I is, opt out? Like, <laughs> this is the, this is the other thing. Can we go create our own little nation uh, yeah. under libertarian principles? <laughs> like, yeah. Cause yeah, neither side is the side I want to be on. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, well, and that's why I didn't end up voting in the end. That's why <laughs> right? I wasn't willing to stand in a line for two hours because like yeah. the libertarian candidate, I, couldn't fully support. Yeah. Um, and I sure as hell didn't want to vote for any of the rest of them. I, like you had yeah. somebody that you actually wanted to vote for on that ticket. I did. I, I, um, and um, Tommy Tuberville, by the way, is yeah. who I wanted to vote for. I wanted to make sure Doug Jones didn't win a second term. Mm -hmm. You know, I just felt like that was not the direction I wanted to see the state go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I did want to make sure I voted for him. Yeah. So. Well, and so one of the, th one of the things that this kind of exposes this discussion is that, there's a real difference in how people view government now than they did at the formation of this government. Yeah. Um, and, and I, I think it can be like really summed up just with a single phrase, um, the, of what the meaning of protection from government means now, as opposed to then. Yeah. Because things like the second amendment, the first amendment, all, all of this stuff was about limiting the power of the government. Absolutely. Um, or, well, it, you know, back to the discussion, I suppose, limiting the authority of the government yeah. um, to to prevent them from exercising power over these areas of life. And so the idea of protection from government to the founders was about protecting people against their government. Yeah. And now when you talk about protection from government to people now, what they think is that you're talking about the things that the government is supposed to provide for you as protection. <laughs> it's true. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah. Um, and that's a real shift in, in it, mentality. It absolutely is. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's dangerous, especially when you start deciding that what a lot of the things that you're talking about, the government's supposed to provide for you somebody else has to produce. Yeah. So you're talking about using the power of government to force somebody to create something for you. Yeah. Yeah. Like there's, <laughs> there's a problem here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you, if you want to dig deeper into that, we did a, a, a classic episode or we republished a classic episode on rights a while back. Go look it up. Yeah. Uh, and it is a good one. Um, yeah. But we talk about the difference between positive and negative rights and why one of them is actually a right and one of them is not. <laughs> yeah, right. You don't have the right to somebody else's labor. Exactly. Period. <laughs> yeah. Back to that slavery thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, it it sounds like hyperbole when you say it that way, but yeah. what's the difference? It, yeah. It's a difference in, in um, degree, not kind. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Well, that's that's mostly what I had on all that. Do you have anything more on the election? I mean, at this point, I don't know yeah. if there's much more to say about it. I, I don't know where we're going from here exactly. Um, I think that uh, that we're looking at um, a lot of civil unrest no matter what. Yeah. Um, on the way in today, NPR was talking about that there were pro-Trump um I guess some protesters or something like that, that were mm -hmm. starting to develop outside some of the polling places and some things like that. It's NPR. I don't know how much I put into any of that. They like to play this stuff up, um, particularly if it's something that's going to make Trump look bad. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm with you as far as like there's, I don't like the direction all of this is heading. Mm -hmm. Well, and so I was looking at some of the protest stuff this morning on the news and it's, kind of amazing to me how things have shifted in terms of like the level of the discourse. And so I, I think back to after Trump was elected and he had Madonna, um, get up there and, uh, you know, rant about how terrible he was for a while. And then say something like love Trump's hate F you. 
And I was like, do you, do you hear yourself? Yeah. And I think about some of the early protests and there was like um, all this, uh, you know, hey, hey, ho, ho, whatever has got to go. Yeah. And and the the level of chanting on the left has really kind of devolved into F Trump, F Trump, <laughs> yeah, right. F Trump. And that's, that's what the protest is now. Like the, yeah. nobody, it seems like very few of them can actually identify any kind of policy issue that they have a problem with. They're yeah. not complaining about policy. They're not complaining about governance. They're complaining about this guy. Yeah. And who cares? It yeah. doesn't matter. All yeah. of them are a-holes. Oh yeah. Like it, Trump it takes is not a, certain a unique le- evil. Exactly. It takes a certain level of, um, I don't know, uh, psychopath to <laughs> reach this level of government at this point anyway. Yeah. Um, none of these people are good. They're yeah. all terrible people. I, I mean, I've said this yeah. over and over again. I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot on this podcast. But, but it deserves to be yeah. said again. Yeah. <laughs> these These are all terrible people. That's how they got there. Yeah, yeah, they wouldn't be there if they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, which is a, a problem in the system. Uh, yeah, you know, in and of itself, you're talking about a, a system that was created to be the smallest government in the world, and it's become the biggest. Oh yeah, in history. Oh, ever. absolutely. Um, and that's and some of the guys were talking in the forum the other day about just this type of thing where the government's gotten to where like neither side's going to budge and the whole mm-hmm. thing and. And I, I didn't say anything, but I almost got in there and said, you know, if the government wasn't this powerful, we wouldn't be fighting over it the way we're fighting over it. Exactly. I mean, if you want, if you truly want to fix the problem and division in this cup in this country, make the government smaller. Yeah, take away the power. Take away the power. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the reason that things are mm-hmm. as divisive, and the reason you have people in the streets. People are thinking, "Oh my God, if if the if my guy don't win, yeah, my life is over." Yeah. Like, and, Every. Every four years now, you have an election to decide who gets to impose their will on the other side. Exactly. Um, And that's not what it was supposed to be about. And we're arguing about the wrong things anyway, at least from our perspective. Yeah. Like, you have the right and the left, and they're, you know, they're arguing over very small differences as far as I can tell. Because the real issue that's the problem is that you have an authoritarian right and an authoritarian left getting, you know, arguing over who gets... To be the authority. Control over um, the power, yeah. Whereas what we should be looking at is liberty versus authority. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm on the side of liberty. And that's why we're always standing alone, libertarians, is because the right and the left, the difference between them isn't that great because both of them are authoritarian at this point. The Republican and the Democrat parties are oh, yeah. both authoritarian. And there is nobody standing for personal liberty, for small government, for not interfering with your life. I mean, I was thinking the other day about, um, you know, like... One of my favorite people to quote is, well, people, um, is Captain Malcolm Reynolds. Ah, yes. And uh, he says, you know, um, leave it to government to unite everybody under one rule so they can be ignored or interfered with equally. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'd rather be ignored. Yeah, oh, um, absolutely. But, (laughs) you know, that's like a real insight into how how an authoritarian government works. Yeah. Um, And that's the right and the left. All they do is they fight over how they're going to spend your money. Mm-hmm. I mean that's that's it. I mean they're both as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and how they're going to extract it from you? Do we do it yeah. by uh, inflation or do we do it by just direct taxing? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Tax the rich. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I, I think uh, you know part of this comes down to the propaganda in schools and so forth. Like if you give the government control of the schools. Do you think that they're going to be taught to question their government? Yeah, absolutely um, not. And I think this is one of the things that we run into as libertarians a lot, um, why there's the internal divide between the left libertarians and and really what I would say are the true libertarians. Yeah. Um, that s- somehow, though, the propaganda is so strong in these schools that are in the and in the media and well know, everywhere yeah everywhere you turn um, yeah and everywhere else that that somebody can reach the point where they really question um the authority of government and the role of government enough to decide that they're a libertarian and yet still somehow believe that there is some role for government in social interactions yeah 
Yeah. <laughs> it's a strange like, place to find you yourself be as a a social justice libertarian. Yeah. <laughs> how I mean how do you justify the government regulating how people interact with each other, yeah. who you associate with and how you do it? Yeah. I mean, and I don't still be a little bit, I, I haven't yeah. been able to wrap my head around it. I, I, I can't either. And yeah. this was one of the th- problems that we had with our particular party, our, our party's particular candidates this year is that like the policy stuff that they were promoting w- was the right things for the most part. Yeah. But there was still all this rhetoric about institutional racism and so on where the government doesn't have a role except, except when it is taking part. Yeah. Um, and other than that, yeah. like free association of people is really kind of a founding principle. Absolutely. Um, so if you want to be racist, you can be racist. We don't approve of it. Yeah. We don't advocate for it. We yeah. think that it'll be a problem for you in the long run because you'll lose business. You'll lose, you know, other kinds of interactions that could be valuable to you. Absolutely. Um, but if you don't want to associate with a people, it is no place for a government to force you to do so. Exactly. The government has no bearing here. Like mm-hmm. it, it shouldn't be involved in that anyway. Yeah. So it's yeah. That the whole the whole Jorgensen thing, it was it was a mess. <laughs> yeah. So I don't really understand how the left libertarians exist. And if there are any of you out there listening that consider yourselves a left libertarian or however you define yourself based on the the parameters that I gave, yeah. contact me. Michael at the Liberty Mike, I would really love to understand how you, no matter what word I choose here, it sounds. <laughs> it's going to be bad. Yeah, yeah. But rationalize or justify yeah. um, your set of beliefs. I, I, and as condescending as that sounds, like I You're really genuine. do. Yeah, yeah. I really do like to try and understand why people believe the way they do. Yeah. Um, I ask a lot of questions and then people get frustrated and stop answering my questions. But, um, (laughs) I, I really have a genuine interest in why people believe the things that they believe. Yeah. Um, and so I, I don't get this Yeah. and I would like to understand it better. I had this problem with just, um, the left in general for years that used to be all I read was left publications because I didn't understand it. Like I didn't understand what they were trying to accomplish, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I actually had some drinks with a good buddy of our, both of ours Mm -hmm. one night and like he laid it all out for me (laughs) and like I I got to quit reading all of that stuff because I was like, I understand it now. Like, I mean, I don't agree with it, but I at least understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. And essentially what it is to, to let people know is it's a faith in government. It's a belief that government can do things that we as libertarians know government can't do. Yeah. Um, it's, it's basically, and that's kind of control a virus. Control a virus, control everything. And that's, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's, that's really what it boils down mm-hmm. to. Economics, too. Like, I mean, it's a belief that government can step in and do these things that history tells you it can't do. Yeah. Um, and, and you end up down this road where you, it's more and more government. Like, mm-hmm. it's just, well, it, we created this problem, so we'll use government to fix it. And then that creates another problem. And then it's, you end up down this road where the it's next thing. It's that school bus. Yeah. It, 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 that you, slid in the ice and then. <laughs> Yeah. The public ambulance service came and crashed, and then the so, two police cars came and crashed. To you know, you do like you just keep yeah. piling on government problems, trying to fix the first one. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, like I say, that's that's my thing on that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, you know, and the thing, the thing about it that really irritates me, and you get this on both sides, but I I hear it a lot more from the left these days, um, is the the idea that they're that they're well, it's the self-righteous, I'm on the right side of history yeah. thing. And, um, you know, taking the pandemic as an example, um, you know, during, I, I can't remember, one of these previous viruses, um, Fauci, yeah, Fauci, uh, Fauci co-wrote a paper about how um, a majority of the problems as a result of the virus were from bacterial infections from people wearing masks, bacterial respiratory infections from people wearing masks. Yeah. Now, here he is on the other side of it now, although he wasn't always on the other side of this issue no, he didn't during start this there. pandemic. Yeah. But, um, you know, here he is on the other side of this now. And so you get into an argument with somebody about whether, it, you know, you should be wearing masks or not. And they're convinced that they're on the right side of history. And what if it turns out in the end that 
that bacterial infections as a result of wearing masks end up killing more people. Yeah. Like not, you can't, you don't see the future. You're not the, a prophet. Like big thing you that, could be right, but you, you might could, not be. Yeah. And maybe you should question whether you know how much you really know. And I really think that the mask thing, I think heart disease is going to be a bit, people who like really wear the mask like all day. I think the 10 years or so from now, we're going to find out they're way more susceptible to heart disease and stuff because, because it just, it raises your heart rate mm. or at least it does for me. Like, yeah. Anytime I've had to wear that thing for extended amounts of time, like I start sweating and I can feel my heart rate rise. Yeah. Now, I don't know. I, who the hell knows, really? But mm -hmm. I mean, it's just something to think about. Like, it's you don't absolutely know that you're doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, I, I know that when I get my allergy shots. Yeah. Um, if if there is. <sighs> If there's any opportunity to take my mask off after I get those allergy shots while yeah. I'm sitting in there, because you, you sit there for like half an hour in case you have a like a reaction. severe allergic reaction. Yeah. Um, so while I'm sitting there in the little waiting room area, the waiting area around the nurse's station to see if I die then or yeah, not, right. <laughs> um, the, if there's not a lot of people in there, like there's a good spacing in there, I pull my mask off. Yeah. And the main reason I pull my mask off is because I think, I feel like, Wearing that mask make, makes the whole thing harder for me. Yeah. That I'm not getting enough air. Yeah. And since the real concern is respiratory problems, that as a result of these <laughs> wearing uh, the mask is of a, these shots, like the yeah. mask creates more of a problem for me. Yeah. And so, like, as soon as I get the opportunity, I pull it off. And then sometimes I forget about it. So somebody comes right up to me and I'm like, oh, yeah, mask, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like stick it back on or the, like coming to check to make sure that my injection sites aren't swollen or whatever. And yeah. I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm asking. But, um, you know, it, it certainly wearing the mask makes it, you know, part of it is an anxiety issue. But it definitely yeah. makes like the whole breathing thing more difficult. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And breathing is important. Yeah. I mean, that's that's been my position. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm I think, sticking with it. I think that the science I, will back you up on that. Yeah. I think I'm on the right side of history. On yeah, that one. There you go. Um, so uh, there's just one other topic that I wanted to hit real quick. Right. Um, and it relates back to that everybody with influence was on the other side in this election. Um, and it's that, uh, Glenn Greenwald, who I have a great respect for, oh. um, there's, there's a collection of, um, progressive left, uh, journalists that I think are really good. Yeah. Like I disagree with them in so many a ways politically, ways, yeah. but I, their journalism is really good. Glenn Greenwald is one of those people. Yeah. Matt Taibbi, uh, Aaron Mate. Um, these are some guys that I really like what they do yeah. and, uh, they're true journalists. Yeah, exactly. They're, they're yeah. truth seekers, right? Yeah. Um, or at least I feel like they are. Yeah. No, I, and, I, I think at least in, I don't know the other ones, but green, 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 Greenwald. What's Glenn his name? Green, Glenn Walt. Greenwald. Yeah, he is like, I mean, I've read it some of it. I think he's coming mm -hmm. from the right place. At yeah. least. I mean, I disagree with him about some stuff, but yeah. So he's one of the co-founders of the intercept. Um, which was uh, established in 2014 to release the Snowden leaks. Yeah. Um, essentially. I mean, that's yeah. not obviously the only thing that they did, but that was one of the main purposes of him forming that uh, that media outlet yeah. um, was to release the, uh, the Snowden leaks. And a big part of it was that the writers would have editorial freedom. Yeah. Um, that they could write what they wanted, et cetera, et cetera. Well. <laughs> Insert irony here. Yeah. So... <laughs> He quit this organization that he co-founded yeah. last week, I guess. Yeah, it was last week. Um, because uh, they wouldn't allow him to run an article as he'd written it that was critical of uh, the Biden family and their connections to Ukraine and Chinese um, influence and uh, and possible corruption. Yeah. <laughs> Can right. you imagine founding a, a, a news outlet on the idea that people can print and say whatever they want yeah. and then have your own one you created censor you? Yeah. Like I just, when I was reading that story, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, they, they said something like the Intercept responded and said that uh, Glenn Greenwald thinks that anybody that disagrees with them is a fascist and um, that anybody who would have the, the gall to um, uh, 
edit any of his work as just a censor or something like that. I can't remember exactly oh, what they said. I don't think he's wrong to believe that. <laughs> well, I, the the funny thing is that I I I mean I. I certainly see some of that in Glenn Greenwald that he's oh, yeah. like, uh, if you disagree with me, then there's just obviously something wrong with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That being said, though, I think that he's got a legitimate beef here. Absolutely. And, um, I, and I think it's absurd that uh, that the editorial board would say that if these like, I mean, a lot of it was based into the laptop stuff right? yeah, yeah um that if these stories turn out to be true then it's a big story but since we don't know you can't print anything about it yet <laughs> well then, i mean the whole point first off there's no indication that any of this is faked first off well yeah um yeah but uh, you know secondly like you can't ignore a story because it hasn't been a hundred percent confirmed Especially yeah. if you think if it were to be confirmed, it's a big story. Well, exactly. And some there are plenty of stories you're not going to get to the bottom of if people aren't out there asking the questions mm-hmm. and writing the stories about it. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's part of how you get to the truth. <laughs> yeah. So, but what you should what you should take from this is that this is a media organization that was founded explicitly on the idea of being able to do true hard nosed journalism without interference for political or ideological reasons. Yeah. That one of the co-founders just quit because they censored his his writing for political or ideological reasons. Uh, I just can't get <laughs> over it, man. Like that's crazy, man. Yeah. That, that's that's 2020 for you, man. <laughs> I guess so. Um so this organization, yeah. <laughs> at least so far, the Liberty Mike is founded on the idea of complete editorial <laughs> freedom uh, yeah. without interference for political or ideological means. Although we do have an agenda. We do have an agenda. <laughs> Absolutely. But I'm not stopping Liberty Larry from saying whatever it is that he has to say. Yep. And uh, if he tries to stop me, then I'll just replace him. <laughs> well, um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you better bring some security is all I got to tell you. <laughs> I'm well armed. <laughs> I'm going to have somebody stopping me at the door next week. <laughs> You're no longer Not welcome yet. We're here. doing fine so far. <laughs> so far. Um, and so, yeah, next week uh, we'll be back um, where when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, uh, follow us on Facebook. Where all do we have now? Facebook. Uh, you can subscribe on iTunes, Podbean, and now YouTube. YouTube. Um, like and share. Uh, comment and... I don't know, whatever else can get our stuff in front of more people. Like yeah. help us out. Absolutely. Um right now that's the name of the game. And uh yeah, in the meantime, try and stay free. Life's short, live free. Ciao. Later.